Hello, and welcome back to The Path. My guest today is Paul Vermiglio Sensei. Paul Sensei is an expert in Kobudo and Shodin Ryu. We talk about many things in the episode. Paul Sensei has an event in April 2020 in England. If you're interested, I'll link the information in the description. Okay, without further ado, let's get into the interview. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for appearing on the program, Paul. Uh, nice, great. Pleasure. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, we've talked. Uh, if But for people who might not know who you are, could you give us a little rundown of your uh, hist training history? or? Yes, uh, my name is Paul Vermilio. I train at the Shimbun Kan. My sensei is Akamine Hiroshi Sensei. Um, I went to Okinawa in 1996. Um, and my background then was uh, 20 years Jiu Jitsu. Um, and I just decided uh, to go to Okinawa to find truth and clarity on my Kobudo experience at the time, which I did through Jiu Jitsu. So in 1996, I was uh, very fortunate to land in the dojo of Aisuke Akamene, who was my first sensei. Um, and I spent just under five years there. And when I left since then, I've been promoting and preserving um, what I went there to do, which is Arko Budo and our Shunri Karate. Um, I meet up most every year with Kaicho at seminars. I go to Okinawa now and then. Last time was last year where I met James. Um, long time no see James, I was actually good in there. Um, yeah, and today it's still going, um, it's still my way of life. So in the uh, early days, in your jiu-jitsu days, uh, you'd done 20 years of it. What, what was it that sort of left you uh, unsatisfied with that? Well, without being too disrespectful, like, you know, I'm not going into details because it's not, it's not nice to disrespect previous uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. It's just that I felt on the Kobudo side, um, I needed to get closer to Okinawa because the Kobudo I was doing, um, I had a lineage to Okinawa, but there was something missing. So um, at that time, I had a government job. I left my government job. I uh, packed two suitcases. I had two thousand pounds in my pocket. Got my ticket, three month visa, and I didn't know what to expect. Um, so it was just to find out clarity and more about the Kobudo side of things. And during my Jiu Jitsu terms. Um, the last three years I started Karate, I started shooting the Karate at the famous Red Triangle. My sensei was Andy Sherry Sensei, or Point Sensei, uh, Fred Brand Sensei. So that was a great start to into the Karate. And the reason I went into the Karate was to actually improve my kicking techniques, which um, um, to help with my Jiu Jitsu, because Jiu Jitsu me was fantastic. I loved the Jiu Jitsu. It was very self-defense, street orientated, but uh, at the time I wasn't a very good kicker or puncher, so that's when I started Shotokan. And I remember Andy Sherry Sensei gave me a great letter to actually help me get into Japan with the government. Um, so basically, getting back to your, your question, yeah, I just felt like there was something missing with my COVID-19. And it was just by chance one day, I went into one of the stores and I picked up a magazine. And in the magazine was a, uh, a story, a profile on Aisuke Akamine. And when I seen that, my heart just broke to it. This is my chance. This is my chance. So I wrote it. It was Don Chaplin, Sensei Chaplin at the time that I corresponded with. And it was, it was actually uh, Sensei Chaplin that helped me then get into working out. So uh, yeah, that was the main reason why I went back to the question, was to find, to find out more about uh, working out, COVID. Because uh, the uh, I assume that the uh, jiu-jitsu training was a was it a mainland Japanese based system or it was the World Jiu Jitsu Federation from Sensei Robert Clark. So it was you would say it was um, it had quite a history going back to Sensei Blundell. Um, he was in the Navy when he and um, when he came back, he kind of started it early in the early fifties, I believe. Sensei Blundell and I joined what was then the British Jiu Jitsu Federation. And then went into the World Jiu Jitsu Federation. Um, so, they were, Sensei Clark was very experienced. Um, but it suited me at the time. 
it suited me at the time. It was good. It was workable on the street. Um, so respect to that. I just loved it. I fell in love with the Jiu Jitsu, but it, it wasn't. Um, I don't think the lineage was with the Yawara group from uh, Okinawa at the time. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure yet. So you'd always had a sort of interest in Kobudo? Well, with the Jiu Jitsu, it was Jiu Jitsu that um, um, started Kobudo. Before that, it was Bruce Lee, of course. What a hero. You know, picked up the nunchaku when I was a kid. You know, I got up and said that was the Bruce Lee, was my hero at the time. So it probably started from there. But my grandfather, I mean, in the martial side, my grandfather was a boxer in Liverpool, Domenico Vernilio, uh, in the famous Liverpool boxing arena. And when I was eight, he got me into boxing. So I did the boxing for three years. Put the gloves were too heavy, James. It was then very old leather, bitty gloves. Man, I couldn't even lift. By the time I lifted the gloves up to protect my face, I was knocked out, you know what I mean, as a kid. I had so many bloody noses. My mother went to Paul, you better stop that. I was only a kid, like. But I carried on for three years. No wonder, you know, I'm five foot six, but my arms are six foot seven because of them gloves. <laughs> you know what I mean, James? So that was my introduction to the kind of, like, um, sort of fighting source of arts. So it was from a little kid that impregnated me to take it on further. Jiu Jitsu from the age of 13. And that's when I got into the martial arts. I think. Yeah. So uh, you moved to uh, Okinawa, you're living in the dojo. How did you uh, actually meet Akamine Sensei? Um, well, after they did all the paperwork and done finalized everything, I got on the plane, it was with China Airlines. I, I was really nervous from England all the way to Okinawa. Um, and when I got off the plane, it was uh, Hiroshi Akami Sensei, uh, Tamiose Sensei, and Don Sensei waiting for me as soon as I got off the plane. I kissed the floor when I got off. When I got off that plane, I actually kissed the ground. It was great. And I got there, I was just so nervous, so shaken. And I remember walking out with my cases and uh, everyone introduced themselves and said, come on, we're going to take you for a drink. So we met the Siemens Club and had a bottle of Budweiser and I went, no way. They drink? I just didn't know. I thought it was, oh no, these are just no drinking, no social life. You know, this thing in your mind when you've never been to a place like Okinawa. Oh. And it really, really settled me down, really settled me down. Um, and, and that's how I met, I kind of said, saying. So we went, we went to Siemens Club for a drink, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> how was the the uh, training? Did it live up to your expectations, or? <clears throat> well, it's it's a very yeah, absolutely. It's a very emotional source of time when I got off the plane. Anyway, I didn't go to the dojo the first first night because uh, they put me in some nice accommodation. But the first session was the night after, and I was a guest and I was watching, and I remember um, Senpai Ikishiro San. He did the nunchaku kata in front of me, and I was just memorized by the hips. It's just like I went so hot inside, my heart started to pump to see the power of the hips, what Senpai was doing, and the technique. And he showed me the techniques. It was just like I decided there and then what I'd learned previously about Kobudo, I decided to put it in the cupboard and close the cupboard, not dismiss it, but to close it because I was in the place, this was the place where I needed to be from that moment on. It was so powerful. The feeling is, it's like a volcano. Your heart opens up and you know, you know, this is the place where you want to be. Like when I left England and left my job, I knew I had to leave. I had to leave, it was time to go. My destiny is across the water and I got the same feeling that night when they demonstrate this awesome power coming through the hips. Never seen it before in my life. Never. I went dead red. I was hot. I was, you, could, you could have lit a match off my face. That's how powerful it was. Yeah. It was the place. Yeah, I found it. I found it, James. I found the Mecca where I wanted to be. It's Mecca for me. You know, it may not be Mecca for anyone else in the world, but it's definitely Mecca for me. Yeah. So... When did you, uh, did you start training just after that or? Yes, right away. Um, I remember Tim, I spent, I spent a few nights in the, um, by the Budokan, 
in the hostel next door because they weren't sure, you know, what this this new guy coming over. They didn't know who it was, did he have a good heart, did he? So he said, Paul, put him in the hostel first. Um, and then after that, I spent a week with Tim Jürgen Sensei on the base camp because he, he must have took a liking to this scouser from Liverpool right away, you know, the connection with the, you know, my good old American cousin. Yeah, he's my brother now, by the way, James, I'd just like to say. <laughs> I'd say maybe listening in from across the water. So I stayed on the base camp for a week. It was great in the barracks with Tim. Um, and then we, we were training right away in the dojo. Yeah. Then after that, um, Kaicho said, OK, Paul, we want, we want you to stay in the dojo. Yes, he said to me, how long do you want to stay? And I said, can I stay 10 years, please? <laughs> he said, you want to stay 10 years? He went, yeah. So that's when I moved into the dojo, the old dojo, third floor, and the tatami mat. There was only three tatami. Um, met all the family into my room. There was a TV there and a radio, but I got rid of the TV and I got rid of the radio. I said, I can't be here. I don't need TV. I don't need the radio. I've got to concentrate and get right into it. And it was just out of this world. Out of this world. The first year, I struggled for the first year. My back was killing me because I was lying on the floor on the mat. <laughs> Mm, I, yeah, had bad, yeah. I had the bad back for a year. Then after that, man, I just settled in. Uh, didn't know, no, I didn't know uh, Japanese at the time. I had something like six months basic training behind me. No one spoke English uh, there in Nesabu. Um, and that's where it all started. That's where it all started. Yeah. So what did the uh, classes consist of at that time? Did they do the karate and the kobudo at the same time? Or did they separate them in different days? or? No, at that time, um, there was three sessions a week, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And it started at 6, so it was about 9.30, and it was karate first, and then kobudo, shorinru karate. And at the time, it, we were called furakoshi shorinru, we were the humble dojo of uh, furakoshi shorinru. In fact, my first black belts, which I've still got now from Kaicho, it's got uh, furakoshi shorinru. And it, it was known at that time, when I was trying to get the connection with furakoshi sensei, shotokan, and the Shonen Ru, uh, and Kaicho explained to me, um, out of respect, Funakoshi was on our uh, humble uh, in the front there, uh, in the showman, uh, with his connection with uh, Taira Shinka Sensei when he was in Japan. Taira Shinka Sensei comes back and teaches a skit kind of sensei, that sensei, um, Shonen Ru, not Shonen Ru, it's Shonen Ru, with, with the background of uh, Funakoshi Shonen Ru. Um, and Kaicho at the time was actually going to, um, he took a Higa Sensei Dojo also uh, for his um, Shonenru fighting because he, he, he took uh, his father taught at Kata at the, at the Homo Dojo, our Homo Dojo. Many times I can remember Dai Sensei with Kaicho um, at the bottom floor with his gear. Uh, Dai Sensei's watching Kaicho was demonstrating his Kata. I used to watch from outside. Um, but he go to, he was sent to, he took a Higa Sensei Dojo. Kaicho Sensei, um, Skushkin Sensei at that humble dog at the time. Because Kaicho, like, he was a fighter. He used to love Kumite, so we went there to learn to Kumite. So, uh, yeah, so get back to the next question. So, three times a week, Karate first, then Kobudo, which was, you know, especially in the hot weather, hot summers, to do your Karate and then go straight on to Kobudo. Man, it was very tough, very tough. And there's one time like, I fainted, actually fainted, and he had to um, um, take me out. It was just so much fun. And um, I mean, one of the reasons I fainted was, uh, I don't mind sharing this with you, is because it was a time when my visa was about to expire. And the second one or third one gone, I don't know. And I was starting to run out of money. So I was, I was so shy. I, was, I started to eat pot noodles only for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. Big pot noodles. I had no other food, so I just had pot noodles, and that's when we had this session in the dojo, I just collapsed. <laughs> and when Kaicho went, why, why, what happened? And I told him, he went mad. He said, why didn't you tell us you wasn't eating? I said, you know, I, said, I think I started crying at the time, I was so emotional, you know. Um, I said I had no money sent in, I didn't know whether I could stay or go. He said, that's it now, you get down there, and you want to have food with my mother every morning. And then after that, they started. He said, "You're staying here. I'm going to get you work." Um, you know, so that's how it happened. Oh, I didn't know I was going to go after that, but um, I was well looked after. 
well looked after. I, uh, I think I might have been an adopted son. Felt like it was an adopted son <laughs> for the children. But he wasn't happy when I collapsed because I was on pop noodles only. James, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to stay. My heart was there, you know. Yeah, and um, so the train yeah three times a week. And then um, during the days I had to train myself. So I worked out on average with my own trainer by myself in the dojo, which was heaven. It, it worked, it, it came to something like for all them years I did, it worked out like some 18.5 hours a week I was training. Mm. For all them years, that's what it, it equated to. And, you know, was awesome. But no more, We, you couldn't train eight hours a day. You know, this, I've heard people before say, oh, we trained eight hours a day in weather like that. Unless you're super, super <laughs> fit or crazy, you just don't do that in Okinawa at all. You know, and in hot weather, you have a knack, don't mean in between. It's impossible to train eight hours a day. Yeah, I wasn't training eight hours a day, it was a few hours a day, three or four, that's all. So, I, I know, but uh, you were doing, you switched over and started doing um, their karate as well? Yeah, the short and real. As soon as I went on, Kaichi went, well, Paul, do you want to do short and real or karate? I went, of course. Man, yeah, you couldn't go there and just do kung fu, though. No. Short and real, right away. Yeah, Bukai Kai, short and real. That's what we're called today. But it's Kaichi, it was there for Pushkin Sensei. And um, the Kappa from um, Ichokahiva Sensei's lineage. <coughs> what we do today, <coughs> and the thing about the karate is, because the history of our Kowudo, how it developed, but the basics was based around short and you know, body dynamics and basics. And that's why I fitted it well. And um, practitioners who do short and fit into our Kowudo, like, like a hand fits into a glove. Other styles that come in that are a bit stiffer and um, struggle a little bit, but it just takes a bit longer to get them, you know, that relaxed kind of, um, and the hips, dynamic hips, speed, relaxation, kime. I think I'll do that. What uh, what year did you leave Okinawa? I left in I think it was the summer two thousand and one. Okay. Two thousand and one, I remember. Because I came, I came and I think I met you in ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yes. Yeah, that's when I first arrived. So now uh, you're. Uh, do you have a dojo in uh, England or? Yes, I um, I don't live in Liverpool anymore. I've moved down to I moved down ten years. I left Liverpool ten years ago. Moved down to the southwest um, for for uh, job. I, mean, I have I have a proper job. I don't teach for a living. Um, I work I'm in the probation in a service, uh, working for a company. Um, but I have a nice little dojo in Cheltenham, in a uh, it's the Cheltenham Ladies College. It's a famous college where students come from all over the world. Been here about a year now. Uh, small students, uh, I don't have the tennis. Um, I keep myself to myself and I've always been like that. I've had bigger classes before, uh, but I, I don't sell my soul for a dollar. I keep true to Kaicho's uh, to Kai father. It was, uh, you know, don't give it away. Um, if, if a student's not willing to accept me in my uh, way, then, you know, I'll stick with one student, that's all I need. That's my philosophy and I hold that today. So I've got a nice little dojo, um, got a nice little um, children's class also in a uh, in Cheltenham, uh, after school activity, um, 10 minute students there. Um, I've still got my students in Israel, which I go every year to teach. Um, and now uh, a new group in Portugal as well. Um, but I, yeah, so basically it's, um, Quantity small, which is what I like, James. Yeah. And I go around to do the seminars and meet up with the other senseis, which is great. But it's all going well, it's all going well. So if someone's um, living around where you're teaching, they want to come by and uh, learn Kobudo, is, is there a process for that? or? Yes, they just have to seek me out. And they can do that um, online, online? or Yes, we're online. And now with the Facebook, um, it's open to the public anyway. But um, yeah, so small, small um, advertising for myself. That's the way I am. That's the way I be. You know, if they want to seek me out, they can seek me out. You know where I am. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I know that 
<clears throat> what would you consider uh, an, a, a defining characteristic of uh, the Kobuto that you do? Like, what would you think of as a specialty? What do you think it excels at? It's quite obvious when you if you compare um, one Kobuto to another. Um, it's the first thing you see is the hip. It's the dynamic hip. Um, movement this is the first thing um, that will stand out and that will be if a, if a person's looking at it and they have a bit of knowledge about Kobudo karate and the lineage of uh, Okinawan Kobudo they'll know what school I'm from um, of course it's the kata also how we hold the kata one, one distinction of how we hold the kata compared to the great Matteo Shimpo Sensei style of Kobudo, which is awesome. There's some great katas of Matteo Shimpo that I'd love to learn one day. Um, just by holding the bow is different when we do Chudan Ski, so that's a big distinction, big difference. And there's pros and cons for both. You know, they, they, they are as equal as each other in greatness. Uh, not one style is better than another. I mean, I don't believe that for the second. The only thing that's different is the person actually doing the style, that, that would be the big difference. So hips, speed, uh, kimi and tension, how we move with the feet and transfer the, the energy from the feet forward backwards to the sides, we do the smooth tension, knees unlocked. They are the pure basics of our cold window. From the basic kata right up to the most senior kata, you have to retain them basics, speed, power, tension, hip work and tandem power. These are the five essential principles that you will see, you will see in our cold window. I, I don't want to name anybody partic in particular, but I, I do see some uh, uh, Kobudo from your lineage that might not emphasize the hip as much. Is that like a personal preference for the teach from the teachers or is just like a slight difference? between the dojos? No, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. It should be the same. It should be the same. Yeah, I, I, I know I know where you're coming from. Um, as you go up the ranks, as you go up the ranks, um, the hips actually become smaller because then you bring in the tandem power and not everybody acquires tandem power. You can't... I remember the Kaicho demonstrated the tandem power on my shoulder and I think it popped out, to be honest. And he said, Paul, I can't teach you tandem power. You have to practice it and practice it. And you will know if you've got this tandem power, deep, deep down the tandem power. So at the beginning, the hips are really, really massive. And then as you go up the ranks, you should develop as a character with your weapon, like in karate. And it gets smaller and smaller, but you should still be able to see it. But yeah, the original question is, anyone who does Tairi Shinkan Sensei's lineage of Kobudo, the way it was taught um, through Dai Sensei as well, should maintain the bakes, basics how Tyler Shinkan Sensei taught it. The hip has to be there. You'll see more and more Kataka today using hips. So this is this, you know, and it's fabulous. In the Kobudo on our lineage, the hip should always be there. Always be there. Yeah. I was interested to get your opinion on, uh, I've heard from different people that uh, well, you know, Senaha Sensei learned a couple uh, Kobudo kata from Tata Shinkan Sensei. And uh, it's very, I would say, very particular to his system of karate. Like it sort of looks like Goju-do. I had heard that uh, Tata Sensei would adapt things depending on the people's system. Did you, had you ever heard anything like that? or No, no. Uh, not, myself, wondered, but not, not in my, not since I've been here or known it was no, it was just all. Um, it's up the parish and consent say, and I think it might have been, you know, I'm not too sure if his relationship with Ichiku Higa sensei, because it was very difficult at the time for um, practitioners to learn probably Arko Wudo from parish and sensei. Um, and with his relationship with Ichoka Higa Sensei, you know, I'm sure I could be wrong, I'm, I'm not too sure really. He said, well, why don't you relax it a bit and use our 
relaxation and hips. And this is how it was developed today. Yeah. But I've never uh, known. I haven't heard so that's a, that. It might have been a, yeah. a later development. It could, the, it could uh, be, James. I, I, I don't know. I haven't. Uh, no worries. So uh, I was interviewing Tim and he was saying that you, the organization is quite large now. It's all over the all over the world. Massive. It is. It's, it's, uh, it's grown ever so big. Uh, Del, Del Hanby Sensei is doing a wonderful job and helping catch on with this. And we've just expanded so big, even I'm amazed. Um, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm over here. I can't help it. Um, um, too much because I'm over here getting on with my own life and work and etc and I'm um, very happy that Del's there and Del Sensei's there and pushing us along but we are expanding um, do you know what it's such a family orientated organisation um, everyone just gets on with it um, no one bemoans, bemoans each other um, we have a very strict regime a very strict regime in our association and it's such a family orientated association which I'm happy to be part of. It's just, you know, I'm lucky. We are lucky. Not saying, you know, that there's plenty of other associations that are the same. Um, so I'd like to, that is a big, big thing with our association. We kind of, we suppress the ego. The ego is very well suppressed in our association. You might see some pockets somewhere like you do it anyway. But we have a suppression of ego it's drummed into us and certainly at my seminars you know no one comes through the door with any ego if they do i'll try and help them try and change them a little bit but um that's a big thing with our association get on let's get on with the job let's train together let's have the hour money afterwards and everyone is happy we actually help each other out it's good to see all the senior ranks today actually do want to help when i see them and they get stuck in yeah, so that's very nice to see, very nice to see. I've uh, interviewed uh, quite a number of your organization's uh, top foreigners and uh, they all seem, seem to have very nice things to say about each other. So yeah, it's, great. Yeah, it's yeah. always great to meet up. Like, I'm going to meet up with a lot next month in Nuremberg. Um, then we're going to Minnesota in August. And that's um, we all support this city, we all support each other. I'll go where I can. Uh, and we all pay our own way, which is fabulous, as long as they look after Kaichu and Russian with the sense and that's what we do. And we pay our own way, we get the same support, same support. So this is a, um, uh, this is a good feature of our family orientated association, is total support for each other. So do you have any opinions about uh, modern sort of Western karate or kobudo that you see around? Well, you know, you know, my early days when I was naive and you'd say, you know, that's not correct. That's not proper. That's not correct. Do you know what? I've dismissed that thought now. To me, they can do anything they want. It could be Coca-Cola root, Pepsi root. Who cares as long as you've got a good sense of and the teaching values to their students. You know, everyone's got something to offer and people can make a choice in life. They can go over there to that dojo, or they can come here to my dojo. They choose. So the most important thing is, to me, is to dismiss what's going on around me. You know, everything has a value. But what I teach is what I teach. You know, and this is my value. So it doesn't bother me at all about any other styles at all. And you know what? When you think about it, it's all about a growing up, isn't it? You know. We stigmatise people, we stigmatise their real heart. You know, is there ever going to be a time in life when this stops? I don't think it is, because this is the game of martial arts, I believe. But with me, you know, it doesn't affect me. I have no concerns, you know, it's just people, you know, if I was to bad mouth a, a, a group of it, like you know, I might as well go back and put my white belt on, because I've just lost everything that I was taught. So your training philosophy is more about uh, personal development than it's is that the most important? It, it, it there's a lot of uh, personal development, but I still retain my think that I got into the martial arts because I wanted to protect myself from the streets, and I still do that today. That's why I teach um, what I'm learning to students. I teach a lot of bunkai, 
what's going on in the streets. I want my students to actually defend themselves because here in England, you know, it can be aggressive, like in a lot of the places. So um, that is still the main philosophy of why I still do my martial arts because I, I want to have a chance on the streets to survive or not get hurt. So I retain that as my priority why I'm still doing martial arts. The rest, the rest with the philosophy, trying to make yourself a better person, um, is part of that. But it's not the most important thing, you know. Will philosophy save you on the street or with a simple bit of technique? I think it's the technique first that will save you on the street, you know. Um, okay, yeah, if you talk your way out of the confrontation, fantastic. That is still part of your martial arts. I don't today, I don't understand when people say, I'm not doing karate, I'm doing self defense. I can't see a difference. Karate is self defense. Aikido is self defense. Judo is self defense. It's about defending yourself against an aggressive person. I can't see the difference between self defense and karate. I don't understand this philosophy whatsoever because what we're learning is self-defense. Preservation and promotion of life is about defending yourself and staying alive. So, you might have a take on that, James. You come across, so I'm doing self-defense today, I'm gonna to do karate tomorrow. I, I can't see the distinction at all. What's your um, feeling on that? Oh, I just... Uh... For me, it's about uh, uh, being able to apply it. I, that's all I've ever really wanted about it. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and the personal development stuff. I've never been to. Uh, I've never thought of it as personal development or anything. Mm -hmm. So, just working out, and I enjoy it. And yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting, and oh, it's really Absolutely. interesting. Mm. <laughs> I agree. It's the application, you know. You know, you, mean, you can teach, you know, you teach punch and kick and kick and punch and kick and punch and kick and punch and, and next next minute someone they get crabs on the street and they don't even know what to do because they're being crabs. You know, it's all in the cat that, everything in the cat that. And, um, you know, in my, in my, my opinion, my feel, strong feelings, there's no secrets here. There is no secrets. All the secrets came out years ago. There's nothing new to write about in what we do. In my opinion, nothing new. It's there in front of us. If we can see it, we've got it. But it's definitely no secrets. It's it's too many years gone down the line. Um, so I always I always ponder when when I hear this is the secret of even today it's it's 2019. It's 2019. Karate Kobudo martial arts has been on for a lot of lot of many many years. We're a generation of pioneers. You know we are very educational people. Uh, so. Maybe one day I can, you know, someone will show me a secret of something that I don't know, but I don't believe there's going to be any secret. There's no secrets there, we know. So, uh, if someone was in the in the same situation you were in when you were thinking about switching over and going to Okinawa, what advice would you give them? Um, if they're thinking that that they're, they're, they've already made the step. There's a five, there's a five cycle here, the step where you're thinking about it. Mm. So it's starting to build up in them. Then the next step is, is okay, so they're contemplating, the next step is to make the move, to do some sort of action. Um, seek out, seek out someone that has a connection with Okinawa. If you can't find anyone who has a connection, then just go online, see, uh, uh, there's loads of dojos there and, um, uh, prominent people seek out James yourself. He's also myself, also. Or if they're like me, take a chance in life, get on the plane, go over there, and just get on the street, and start walking around. Um, I think I believe there might be a program today um, with I don't know the gentleman Mark. He has the dojo bar. Oh, he, James Pankowitz. James, James. I think he's um, maybe starting some sort of. Uh, people want to come over some sort of cultural um, uh, experience. That may be a great avenue to go down also. Um, but yeah, just seek out someone uh, from Okinawa. 
um, and then plunge in there, take the chance, and plunge in. Yeah. So there's no regrets about. Uh... No regrets. No. You know, James, my life has been brilliant. My life is brilliant. I made the right decisions in life. No regrets whatsoever of uh, packing up and leaving. No. You know, I'm the luckiest. I feel I'm the luckiest person in the world to have gone there. I'm still associated with Okinawa. I love the training. I've met so many great people, students, and I'm still doing it today. It's like, it's, yeah, I'm the luckiest person in the world. Life every day, I always say every day is a holiday. It's an absolute holiday, and that's going to remain with them. Absolutely wonderful. No regrets, one bit. No. Hmm. Is there anything you'd want to talk about, or you'd want to say, or? No, but I have two crazy little philosophy, or little, I don't know if you call it philosophy as well. But um, what I'd like to say to the audience is two things. One, wear your black belt, cherish your white belt. And secondly, if you are looking for something instant, please do go to the supermarket and buy a pot noodle. They're the two great wisdom paragraphs from Paolo Vermilio. Yeah, there's definitely no uh, instant answers in Okinawa, that's for sure. <laughs> Things move pretty slowly. Mm, mm. Okinawa time still, James. Okinawa yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do actually miss the Alamori as well from uh, Okinawa. Oh, that's gorgeous. Uh, I think if we win the lottery, I might just open a, an a imported Alamori distillery. That would be awesome. Mm. Oh, so yeah, and I do. strong for me. <laughs> yeah. You still drink the Alamori? Uh, not by choice. <laughs> I find it's uh, it's actually quite smooth and it's hard to control how much I'm drinking so <laughs> drink it too quickly oh, it slides so down a little bit it's part of life eh? what do they say inochi inochi no kusuri <laughs> medicine oh, for the life medicine uh, of life inochi yeah. no kusuri lovely yeah well uh, we're coming up on 40 minutes uh, thank you very much for uh helping me out with this project and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon in Okinawa. Will do James, unless if you come over next April, I'm actually running a seminar myself and I'm going to have a uh, tournament. It's going to be, um, the tournament is, um, it's going to be the Shinken Taira Cup, which I'm, uh, I'm going to call it that, but I'm going to, it's going to be a premier, premier tournament. There'll be individual Kobudo weaponry, but what I'm going to do also, there's going to be a category for team Three, three pe people, three persons demonstrating a, a bow kata, and then after that, they have to demonstrate the bunkai of the kata, what they just done, and they'll get points for both. Now, it's never been done before, but I think um, I'm going to add this in to see how they uh, work together. But I'm very interested in, you, you know, tournaments, um, it's a wash where you do one kata, it's just kata, 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 kata. I'm very interested. I need to know part of my development. Do people really know what they're doing, students? Show me in the bunkai. I need to see this dynamic bunkai at the end. So what I'm going to do is team in threes. Uh, they'll get the points for the for the team and then they will have to demonstrate the bunkai. And the bunkai will not be just itch ni sanchi. It'll have to be a flowing sequence of movements um, similar to uh, the premiership of the karate where they do the bunkai, you know, um, that's, that's one thing I always look over so many years. Okay, you're fantastic at doing the kata. Show me you understand the kata now. Show me fight. I think it's very important is to get as close to the past as we can. And the risk the risk level goes up when you when you're actually fighting with, with weapons. And you have to fight with the real weapons in my eyes, not rubber weapons. You know, unless of course you're teaching kids, you know, we have to be sensible here. And the only way to get that stage is actually to practice the cool table with the weapons and the bunkai. It's when you don't practice that, you get someone to do it is when they get injuries. Um, so I'm, when you see me on my seminars, the little clips on Facebook, you will see a lot of this uh, bunkai that I do. And 
sort of like I call it sort of um, um, outward thinking take your blinkers off if you do show my Nucci that way for the next 25,000 years I tell you what you can actually do it this way as well you know you have to learn you have to learn the body to adapt to we are three we are three dimensional people we move three dimensionally why move two dimensions so long and when you put the third dimension in you get confused and the body will not act quickly my my train is based around three dimensional you do a showman you this way okay try it this way it could be a reverse one that's how i work and the bulk height is very important but let's get as close get as close to how it was when it all started when people started using weapons whether it was in scandinavia uh, japan in, in you know all them years ago where people were fighting for survival no robin hood they had the bow <laughs> you know and that's what they used they practiced and they practiced they just didn't hit fresh air um, so it's very important okay so that's why on the competition i'm going to have this category in because i want to see i want to see development uh, uh, development of students show me do you understand how to use that kata in a life, in a life situation show me so that's it uh, so that's going to be awesome so um hopefully i can get some people coming over like um so that, and that'll be next april would that be open to uh, general public as well or just, it'll be open just... okay they will have to have a lineage of uh, Shikantara, you know, because basically it's it's the seminar is for my students coming over from different countries. So I said, okay, let's I'm going to open it wider. Uh, for anyone who's got the Tadi Shikantara lineage and do our kata, um, then I'll, we be, our, our judges and myself be able to judge it. I could I would not be able to judge other styles, uh, but that's not what it's about. It's just our style. Um, and a little bit of flavour, you've got to have that flavour to when you train, you know, um, that, that's, that's, that is development. I'm, I'm not, I always question why, why is it after 25 years, you've got a gold and a rock down and a seminar doing basics, very basic stuff. We all do basics, we do them every week. I think there's a time where you have to actually put the basics to one side to actually develop a little bit more than just basic. You know you've got advanced basic. You've got a basic movement and you can turn that basic movement into an advanced music. Air music, air move. Um, you know, you take Fuji Kata Itch the first move and turn left, get down. You can do it normal, you can do it medium, or you can do it with actually great power. Great power and speed, which makes it more advanced. Um, so it always, I always question I always question teachers, very advanced teachers throughout the world, um, why they insist in teaching at seminars, high-ranking practitioners, the basics, just the basics. It kind of, um, yeah, interesting, interesting thought that on my seminars, I know when I go to my students, I know they've been trained in the basics. I know the basics are absolutely fantastic. And I can't see the value of me going over there and doing the same basics. No, I go there to teach something else. I go there to give them some flavor of the basics. You know, that's the value they get from me. They spend all that time investing in me and I'm going to give them something they already have. I leave that to my students that teach their students. That's their job. My job is now to advance them from the basics and upgrade it to the next level. That's how I conduct my um, my seminars. And it's, it's fun as well. And it's great when you see them there and they're really getting confused. It's the same basic. It's the same basic. It's just the dimensions different. And you go, oh, that's what I want them to do. I want them to go, oh. I say, yeah, take your blinkers off. See 360 degrees, 180 is great. Now you're with me, blinkers off, now you can see 360. That's how I've developed as a, as a, as a teacher, you know. And of course, if, if it's a basic, if it's a student who's at a certain level, I'll keep them with the basics, but I'll still give them a little bit of, a bit of sniff of the future for them, yeah. I'll, uh, <clears throat> if you give me some information, I can link it in the description of the video and uh, people are interested they can contact you about uh, attending or watching or well i've got the poster nearly i'm just uh, uh, a couple of weeks i'll send you the poster that's all right so that could be okay sure. james 
yeah? Yeah, sure. I'll send you the poster, and um, that would be most appreciated. Wonderful.